This compilation will surely make your day. You can watch this if you're looking for something to do, if you're bored, if you want something in the background, or you're looking to hear about Stranger Tees. Make sure to like and subscribe to this channel, turn on the notification button so next time you can't sleep you know where to go. Leave the timestamps of the videos that you want to recommend to others in the comment section. Let's begin. What's your greatest I'm effed moment? Story 1. Back in 2000, I was in 5th and 6th grade. Brand new computers, stupid adult entertainment websites changed my homepage of browser and installed toolbars. I thought I removed them and changed the homepage the night before. Next day while I was in school, dad turns on computer and homepage was changed back to that adult entertainment website automatically and toolbar was installed automatically again. I come back from school and dad tells me, we need to talk, but first let me go use the bathroom. While he was taking a crap, I turn on computer and open that big E Internet Explorer icon. Homepage and toolbar is back. I quickly change the homepage and remove toolbar. When he gets out of the bathroom, tells me to open that big E. I did, and homepage was yahoo.com. He is like, close it and open it again. And yahoo.com again. He walks away without saying anything. That whole week I scrambled around on how to fix this issue knowing we just spent 2k on a computer. That whole week I left the computer on so homepage will not change back to malware infected adult entertainment website. That whole week, mom and dad tried to find a way to talk to me about it, but they couldn't, and they just let it go. I ended up reformatting the PC with the CD that it came with. Story 2. I'm pretty severely diabetic. Because of that, I have bad circulation, and I'm very susceptible to infections, especially in my legs. I went to bed one night, we were going camping, my favorite thing in the world, the next day, so I had trouble falling asleep. Once I finally did sleep for about two hours before waking up freezing cold and with terrible pain in my left leg. I woke my wife up because I was shivering so hard. She drove me to the ER and they admitted me immediately. My fever was so high I was delirious and was fighting and growling at the nurses who were trying to get my vitals. My wife eventually calmed me down enough for them to do their job. I had contracted strep in my leg. If I'd waited until morning to go to the hospital, I'd probably be dead. I do remember thinking on the way to the hospital before the madness set in that this was the flare-up that was going to kill me. It was pretty scary listening to my wife tell me about my behavior with the nurses. Lunging at them when they tried to put a blood pressure cuff on, biting at them when they tried to take my temp. It was more like having rabies than a skin infection. I don't remember that night at all. Only the stories. Story 3. I got pulled over on a first date when I was young. I had a suspended license and a warrant because of it. I knew it was coming as soon as I saw him behind us. Lights came on, I turned to the girl and said, Well, I'm going to be arrested here. If you'd like to continue this date at a later time, take my wallet and come bail me out. I figured I was effed either way, but I had to trust her. So I handed her my wallet and waited for the inevitable. Sure enough, she drove my car to the station, paid the bail with my money, and then waited in the front for hours while I sat in holding being processed. Of course, she told the entire staff that this was our first date and that I was really nice and on and on. Needless to say, the guards were ribbing the hell out of me back in holding. They immediately started calling me first date. The topper of the event was the intake guards printed her out a copy of many mugshots as a keepsake of our first date. I took it in stride. After five hours, I was released, and we went on our date to a 24-hour diner and had a good time talking. Dated about a month or so longer than went our separate ways. Nice girl. I still think fondly of her for being a good sport. Story 4. My first time being on a ship navigating in dense ice, Antarctic pack ice, we got stuck and couldn't budge. Nearest port was two weeks sailing away. Nearest ship was maybe a week away. After trying to nudge back and forth for three hours, I started getting nervous. I was not the navigator, but a comms officer, so only observing. I went down to my cabin, pulled the survival suit out from behind my bunk, put on a second layer of wool, laid out my head torch, seasickness meds, snacks, and spare glasses, and tucked them in the waterproof bag and went up to the bridge. Then I cycled all the batteries on the emergency radios and made sure there were plenty of fresh spares, and I set the Pelican cases out on the bridge wing. I then double-checked the chargers for the backup power bank and did a routine test on all comms gear as well as fired up the Inmarsat stations. Shortly after, during dinner, the wind had changed and the ice broke up so we could keep going. The lesson taught me that I can keep a cool head, and knowing that has helped me in a lot of other stressful situations. 
I now work with organizing SAR operations at sea. Story 5. My best friend and I were about 10 years old. We'd often go to the elementary school to skate on the weekend because it had lots of cement walkways. One day we noticed the teacher's lounge. I wiggled the doorknob, and it opened. This was very cool, a forbidden adult place, so naturally we walked in. We didn't take anything, but had a good look around. As we exited the lounge, a cop car pulled up. We just about crapped our pants. The cop asked us what we were doing, and we blubbered out, just looking. He proceeded to get our names and phone numbers, then put us in the back of his cruiser. By this time, we are sobbing. He left us in there and went into the room and looked around. When he came out, he let us out of the car, but we weren't home free. He told us to go home and that he'd be calling our parents soon. We went home, and every time the phone rang, I knew my life as I knew it was over. It was awful. This went on for a few days until I realized he was never going to call. That cop was smart. His punishment was far worse than anything my parents would have done. Every once in a while, you get one of those nice folks who knows that sometimes it is best not to chance getting a kid in major trouble with a parent you know nothing about, and instead just teach them a lesson in your own, more subtle way. Story 7. It was a cold night. I was driving down the highway on a 20-mile stretch between my origin and my destination. I had the window cracked as I was smoking and was washing out the tiny crack in the window. As I finished my cigarette, I went to flick my cigarette out the window when it bumped against it and instead fell into my door jam, which happened to be semi-full with papers. It immediately caught fire. I rolled the window down and started throwing flaming pieces of paper out the window. Mind you, this was a completely empty highway at about 4 a.m. I was watching the road ahead of me to make sure no cars were coming as I scrambled to throw the flaming pieces of scrap out my window. As you can guess by now, the cherries came on and I was pulled over. I drank that night and just knew I was going to blow over the limit. Definitely my worst, well, I'm effed moment. But because of that moment, I am where I am today and I stopped driving after imbibing even a little. And things are pretty good all around. Zero out of ten. Would not recommend. Story 8. I was working in an animal shelter when we got a meth-addicted Rottweiler in. She lived in a home with two meth addicts and makers. She was a trained attack dog, and she was also detoxing. Needless to say, she was pretty vicious. The officer that brought her in went with me to put her in isolation kennel so he could take photos for evidence or something. When I got her in the kennel and loosened the loop on the catch pole, she managed to barge her way out of the kennel, and now she's loose in the isolation room with me and the officer. I got her to stop moving, and I'm about to slip the catch pole around her neck when the officer tries to be a gentleman by grabbing the pole and trying to get her under control. She redirects her aggression and chomps down on my inner thigh and starts to shake. Thankfully, I was able to reach down and give her neck and head a big hug so she couldn't move, and she let go. The officer got her on the pole and took me to the hospital. Now the city cops won't pull me over as a sort of apology. At least not for speeding within a reasonable amount over, anyways. Folks, if you are in a situation with a somewhat unpredictable animal and you are with someone whose job involves dealing with potentially difficult animals, don't do crap without asking them or getting orders from them, please. Story 9. This was when I was in 7th grade. I went to a really small Catholic school and my parents a lot of times helped out around the school on weekends. So I was often there in an almost empty school with nothing to do really. I, for some reason, had a very different locker than most of the other kids in the school. Mine was a really short locker, but very wide. I had always wondered if I could fit inside of it. I figured this was a good time to do it with nobody around to see me finally solve this stupid mystery. So I get inside, and I'm kind of scrunched in there. Well, the goddamn door shuts on me. I'm trying to use my fingers to open the latch from the inside, but I can't do it. So I've locked myself inside my own damn locker until probably 20 minutes later my dad and another adult family friend comes along and I start pounding on the door. They laugh and laugh and laugh and laugh. You know what, I'll just let you guys know when they're done laughing. It's been 14 years, so I'm not sure that's going to be anytime soon. Story 11. After skipping lunch during a business trip, I was starving when the dinner appetizers were being passed around at a formal function after work hours. So I grabbed a shrimp on a toothpick and it managed to slide down my throat after one bite almost whole. I can't get any air out or in. 
After 20 seconds or so, I make eye contact with an executive from my company and I make the universal sign for choking. He gets it and asks me if I was choking and I nod yes. He asks me if I want the Heimlich and I vigorously nod yes. He does it quickly and effectively and the offending shrimp was dislodged into a handy napkin, not shot across the room like in the movies. The whole process took less than 30 seconds and people standing 5 feet from us didn't even know it happened. Choking is a very silent way to go. I actually choked on a slice of bratwurst when I was like 5 or 6 years old and holy crap the panic I felt was wild. Thank heavens my uncle, the only adult around, knew the Heimlich maneuver and saved my life. I did not enjoy the taste of bratwurst for literally like a decade after that. Story 14. About eight years ago, my friend Drew flicked off this truck full of bros that was tailgating us. They followed us to a grocery store parking lot and got out to confront us. I peeled out, started speeding down the road, and next thing I know, I'm in a full-on car chase. My dumb butt turns off the main road because I was hoping I could lose them. Nope. They cornered us in a cul-de-sac. All the bros got out of the truck, and two of them had bats. I was pretty sure I was about to die. Dude came to the window and started screaming at me about how much of a P I was and how easily he could kill me. He made me tell him I was his B. And I assured him that I was his B. He made me say it about eight times. Then he bucked at me, turned around, got in his truck, and left. Scariest experience I've had in my life. To this day, I won't even honk at someone no matter what they do on the road. Yeah, I tend to be a bit of an angry driver if someone cuts me off or is driving dangerously, and I am often tempted to flick people off or do something to get their attention. Then I remember that I know nothing about that person, what weapons they might have, and just how much angrier they might be than me. And I just go on my way. Story 17. The moment I almost rear-ended a parking car going 50 kilometers per hour, 31 miles per hour, on my bicycle. I was going downhill without a helmet on, smart, I know, when I suddenly noticed the parking car. I tried to brake but just ended up sliding my way towards it. Entering the road to go past it was not an option as cars were driving by, so of course, I did it anyway. I somehow managed to squeeze between the car and the traffic, slid my way along the parked car's side, tore off the mirror and flew across the bonnet, my bike going the other direction. Miraculously, I wasn't even bruised slightly. My bike was barely bent at all, so I just sat there and tried to process what just happened. I could have died easily that day. As someone who used to do a lot, and I mean a lot, of cycling, folks, wear a helmet. I've known people who are very much alive solely because of wearing a helmet. It isn't worth taking a risk when you can be going at car speeds without the body of a car to protect you. Story 27. I broke up with my abusive ex-boyfriend back in August. I started to ignore his phone calls and texts because I was trying to move on. This peed him off a lot. One day I'm at home alone and his car pulls into my driveway. He slams the door closed and starts banging on my front door. I'm about to dial 911 when it stops and I start to calm down a little bit. And then I heard the back door slam shut and him screaming my name. He jumped the fence and managed to get it unlocked. That was about the time that I figured I was effed. Jesus, I'm so sorry. At least you're here writing this, so I feel like you managed to survive, but even still, that is just awful. Story 31 Got double jumped by a way bigger kid on one of the old school trampolines back when I was about 10 years old. My trajectory had me coming down on the rail right between my legs. I summoned the power of a thousand 10 year olds and managed to stop my entire body with my hands on that rail. I now have a three year old son as a reward for my burst of strength. My nads lived to spunk another day. I feel like any time I've ever been on a trampoline could be my, well, I'm effed moment, because those things are just made to hurt people. Damn it, they are so friggin' fun, I would jump on one right now if I could. Who's the stupidest person you've ever met, and what story perfectly sums up their stupidity? Story 1. There was this guy in my high school that wasn't too bright and was mostly harmless, but about halfway through decided he was gonna be a thug. One day he goes into a class of first years when their teacher wasn't there and robs all their electronics, cash, and valuables at knife point without covering his face and before he left gave them his real name saying, and you better not tell them it was me, Jim Conrad, that stole all your stuff. 
He then proceeded to leave school grounds with all the stolen stuff, but decides against stashing it off campus, and so came back with all the stolen stuff in his backpack and went back to spy on the class with his backpack full of loot while police officers were taking statements to make sure they weren't ratting him out. Edit, for those who want the end of the story, but it's too buried to find. The kids all rat him out, and when he hears his name, he steps into the class proclaiming he'd gut them if they didn't take back saying he did it, with all the officers still in the class and all his loot on his back. He was expelled and arrested, and when word got out, our year group, everyone just facepalmed. Edit 2. I don't know why he's so stupid, but it wasn't an isolated act of idiocy. It was quite well known by everyone in my year group how dumb he was. In fact, he didn't even qualify for admission, but his family called in a ton of favors to get him in on recommendation. Story 2. This girl I went to school with thought Earth had two moons and adamantly argued with me and a teacher. Edit, I should have included more information, but I am new to this, so I apologize. The girl thought that there were two moons of the same size, one on each half of Earth. She thought that the Earth didn't rotate while in orbit. She also thought that since the sun was so big and bright that it blocked the moon during the day. None of anything she said made sense, and she would not answer any further questions or follow up with any rebuttals. I did not try to make her feel stupid, I don't like doing that to anyone for any reason, and once I saw how set she was on what she believed, I backed off because I'm not one to force any views, beliefs, facts, or opinions on someone. And I never said that I don't give my opinion or views, or that I don't present facts, I do. I will always say what I have to say, but after a certain period of time when a conversation comes to a complete standstill and nothing is getting through to a person, I do choose to walk away. And I do so knowing that I tried my best and nothing I can do will be effective. Yeah, sometimes no matter how much you want to help inform someone, nothing you say seems to get through. As the song says, you've got to know when to hold them and know when to fold them. Story 3. I knew this guy in high school really thought his practical jokes were hilarious. He would just do stuff designed to pee you off, thinking your salty reaction would make it funny. You may be thinking, this guy's a D, and you'd be right, but he's also incredibly stupid because every time someone said, dude, effing chill out with your BS, he just blew it off. Social stupidity, I guess. Well, one day he knocked this kid's hat off his head. These guys were friends, but clearly there was some hostility. Other kid picks up his hat and tells Pranker to F off. Pranker smacks his hat again. Other kid tells him if Pranker knocks his hat off a third time, he'd knock Pranker's head off. Pranker has a crap-eating grin, completely oblivious to how dead but serious this guy was, and got absolutely clocked in the face when he effed with this guy's hat a third time. All he could say was, what the F man, chill out! But no one was willing to hear him out. Story 4. I worked with a man named Roy. Roy had theories about how to live life. Roy-conomics. One day he turned to me and the other member of the crew. You boys want to know how you get nice things? He asked. You go to the store and you finance everything. New furniture, new appliances, television, stereos, everything. Then you don't make any payments and you don't show up for your court date. They'll end up garnishing your wages, but they take way less than the payments would have been. Then, about a week later, you boys want to know how to buy a house? You apply for every credit card you can possibly get. You take out your entire balance in cash from all of them and you use that for your down payment. Then you don't make any payments, and you don't show up for your court date. For people thinking that they may know this specific Roy, I last saw him 10 years ago. At that time, he was in his early 50s, was rocking a gray-slash-blonde skullet, and lived in a hamlet in the province of Saskatchewan. Story 5. Guy in my aircraft technician class. I'll call him Jim. The module at the time was about electrical power. We were having a review one Friday before the exam started. Earlier that week, we had covered the batteries used on the aircraft, what types, how they were constructed, etc. Trainer turns to Jim and asks him about the different types, expecting him to say lead acid, lithium ion, and so on. Nope. Jim thinks for a moment and says double A, triple A, C. When we got to the hangar for work experience, the same trainer had lost all faith in Jim. We were all assigned jobs in the morning. Me and another guy on wings, couple more on landing gear, all down through the group. Then he gets to Jim, placed an A4 sheet of paper on the ground and told Jim to stand on it so it didn't blow away. We all laughed, Jim included. The trainer was joking, right? He wasn't joking. 
Jim stood there all day. I mean, I want to say that the trainer's job should be trying to find ways to help Jim, but at the same time, I have no idea just how bad Jim was. Frankly, I've known a few Jims I would have liked to have act as paperweights, so I can't blame him. Story 6. The first time I met Ben was at Improv 101. He was only taking the class for fun, but about half the people there were aspiring actors, including Ben. On the first day, the teacher had us all play this silly game to break the ice and so we'd all remember each other's names. The rules are pretty simple. 1. Pick an adjective that starts with the same letter as your first name. 2. Introduce yourself using adjective plus first name. And 3. Do a simple gesture that goes with it. So everyone is going around the circle introducing themselves as Daring Daniel and Lonely Lauren and Awesome Alex until we get to Ben. He introduces himself as Surfer Ben. He proceeds to misunderstand at least one key element of every gamer exercise for the rest of the class. I have no clue how this man functions in daily life. He has since managed to get a few featured extra roles on TV, though. Improv is hard, but you want to know one of the most important parts of improv? Listening. Ooh, Ben, I've got bad news for you. Looks like you might need to hang ten on out of that class, buddy. Story 7. Guy I worked with named Buddy bought a huge snap-on rollaway toolbox for over $3,000 on credit. Two days later, he sold it to a co-worker for $1,500 because he had some overdue bills and had to pay them. Needless to say, he never paid snap-on for the toolbox. He was off into the winds after he was fired for starting his fourth fist fight at work. One of the other guys I worked with told the snap-on salesman where Buddy's new job was, and last we heard, they are now garnishing his wages. Guy was a nutcase, though. He had very thin skin, and the slightest thing would set him off. He goes absolutely nuts when he was set off, though. He yelled at the security guard and threatened to have him fired because he didn't like his tone. He almost got fired three times for fighting, but he was also able to win the department manager over until the fourth time. Oh, and one time he was told to put caution tape across a malfunctioning gate, and he said, I don't know how. Story 8. My ex-husband. We were playing rock, paper, scissor to decide who had to go change the baby best two of three. Round one, I throw scissor and he throws rock. I win, he proclaimed. Round two, I throw paper and he throws rock. I win, he says again. Um, paper beats rock, I tell him. His response, no, rock beats everything. I spent like five minutes trying to wrap my mind around this. Finally, I ask him, then what's the point of even playing? In total sincerity, he says, to have fun. Clarification edits. One, no, sadly, he was not trolling me. He was completely serious. I know it's hard to believe, but in all fairness, he was born and raised in Florida. Two, yes, I changed the baby. I did pretty much everything involving the baby after that. Three, as for my own level of intelligence and that of my son, I think he said it best himself when, at four years old, he said to me, Daddy can't help. What's your excuse? I was about to make a comment, but then I looked back at the first sentence of this story. My ex-husband. I can't say too much about your intelligence level, but I see you made at least one good decision. Story 9. My mom's cousin was the getaway driver when his friends held up a 7-Eleven. He had some outstanding tickets at the time. As he was driving his moron friends home, he sped past a cop who inevitably pulled him over. He defended his bad driving by telling the cop he was just the getaway driver. Then he got arrested. He has since been arrested for a series of other similarly stupid crimes. He also believes that there's a global cabal of Jews who are out to get him. Recently, he got a DUI, which got his license revoked. This was obviously because of the Jews, and not because he decided to drive drunk past a police station. When he was denied a gun license, that was the Jews at work. I have no idea why he thinks a global cabal would be focused on some moron from Saskatchewan. Roy? Are you back at it? What is up with Saskatchewan? Story 10. I've posted this story before, but this seems like another appropriate thread for this story. One night during high school, my friend and I got invited to a party. I didn't drive back then, so my friend picked me up. All went well on our way to the party. On the way back, however, he got pulled over. As we were pulling to the side of the road, I told him that I was going to pretend to be sleeping since I was the passenger. 
Anyway, I hear the cop get out of his cop car, walk towards our car, stops at the window, but doesn't say anything. I can feel the brightness of his flashlight, but I don't hear him or my friend say anything. After about what seemed like an eternity, I decided to open my eyes to see what was going on. That's when I see my friend, the guy who was driving, is pretending like he is sleeping too. Story 11. I knew this guy in high school that was a huge idiot. The best story about his stupidity happened when he and another friend got pulled over by the cops. Instead of acting like a normal person, he gets the hilarious idea to step out of the car and proceeds to run as fast as he could down the block. The cops, of course, chase right after him, not amused at all. He gets a couple of blocks away and decides to turn around, put his hands up in the air, and screams, Psych! The cops, of course, did not find any humor in this situation and tackled him to the ground and arrested him. Keep in mind this was before YouTube prank videos, so he wasn't doing it to gain subscribers or anything. He did it because he was a moron. Story 12. Had a guy in a third-year undergrad developmental psych course raise his hand in a full lecture hall and ask the professor, Professor, do infants diagnosed with SIDS get asthma later in life? Like, are they more likely to get asthma? SIDS stands for Sudden Infant Death Syndrome. He just kept pursuing the question. The professor didn't understand how she could answer it. She thought there was some kind of logic in it that she wasn't seeing. Finally, some girl took the initiative to shout across the room, No, they are not more likely to get asthma. They are dead. They have died suddenly and will thus not be at risk of developing asthma. Great day. He always sat in front of me and I would see him writing just absolutely horrible poetry and song lyrics. There is a special kind of frustration you only find in college classrooms where there is one student who doesn't seem to understand just the simplest concept. The rest of the classroom grows more and more frustrated as the teacher tries to comprehend what is happening. Story 13. I once had a property manager, person in charge of the rental I lived in since homeowners who lived out of state, who did a bunch of obnoxious things. My husband and I thought she was greedy and maybe getting money for herself and hiding it from the homeowners for repairs or something like that because of shady seeming things she would do when we had repairs. Then we mentioned something about gardening. She said, you know, I've always wanted to try growing tomatoes and just watering them with salt water. That way the tomatoes would already be salted when you ate them. Huge reminder to never attribute to malice what is just pure old-fashioned being dumb as a rock. Story 14. There was a troubled kid I went to high school with. He struggled with school but had friends but was starting to do drugs and go down a bad way. He decided to photocopy the front and back side of a $20 bill, cut it out of normal paper, and glue the two halves with Elmer's glue. What's even more sad is that to test his new money, he went to the gas station and bought some gum, and it actually worked. So in his mind, it must have meant that it was foolproof. So then he tried to go and deposit the glued up money at an actual bank. He was obviously found out and arrested. I don't know where he is now, but I'm assuming he's making similar life choices. Story 15. Literally had this guy got fired last week for doing this. Whenever a customer would enter the store, he would mimic everything they said whilst already bad enough, he would try his best to copy their accent too, no matter what accent it was. Multiple complaints to our store have been made about this guy, and he had plenty of warnings. Well, last week he finally got fired while serving an Asian customer, and in full view of our manager, he says... Yeah, I'm not an idiot, so I won't be saying that. Got pulled into the office, where apparently he still maintained he'd done nothing wrong and couldn't understand why he was being fired. Definitely a dumb butt. Story 17. I had a manager named Roxanne, Rocky. She was a bleach blonde, literally bleached her hair once a month and then wondered why it broke slash fell out. Bubblehead, who only had the job because daddy owned the restaurant. Rocky was really obsessed with her looks, and not much else. One day she told me and a co-worker that she had her nose job done so that her eventual children wouldn't grow up with the same nose as her. She wasn't kidding. The co-worker and I just looked at each other and walked away. Knew it wasn't worth the effort. You don't know. Maybe her nose job was just some crisper, gene-altering new science. Maybe her children will have perfect noses and, uh... <laughs> What am I even doing? God, this comment is dumb. Now I'm the dumb one. Oh, I'm sure the one person every video who comments, I wish you didn't do comments and just read the stories, is just loving this. Well, now I'm going to make this comment even longer just to spite you, because I wish you didn't do comments. 
This is how I do things on this channel. And if you want stories without comments, go read a book, you goober. <laughs> I don't even remember what this story was about now. <laughs> story 21. My brother's now ex-girlfriend. Super kind lady. When she found out I was a vegan, she literally went through every kind of meat she knew and asked if I could eat it. It was a little painful. Cute story about the same girl. Anytime we would go on a road trip and she saw cows, she would always softly moo under her breath, even if she was in mid-conversation. First one's kind of just like she was curious and went about it the wrong way, but the second one is pretty heartwarming. I'm sorry, but this woman wins this thread for me. She sounds absolutely delightful, and frankly, I will now also softly moo at cows when I see them. Story 28. An old co-worker named James. We worked at McDonald's and we were both 16. One time while mopping the lobby, he, for some unknown reason, decided to chase a number of customers around with the mop yelling, I'm gonna get ya. He was fired on the spot. Did something goofy that makes a good story and got to stop working at McDonald's? I hate to tell you, but I think James is smarter than you think. What's the most out of touch thing you've heard a person say? Story 1. I don't understand why you bother renting an apartment. Just buy a house. My dad, who hasn't purchased a house since 1993. My advice to my younger colleagues is to buy a house in the year 2000, like I did. They don't seem to appreciate it. Kids these days. I bought my house in 2016 in western Pennsylvania before housing prices started skyrocketing here. My house has a 60% increase in value in those six years. If I sold, I'd get more money back than what I paid in mortgage payments the last six years. Even more absurd, per Zillow, my house has increased in value $6,500 plus in the last 30 days. Why do you keep taking these low-paying jobs? My parents, who think I work horribly crappy jobs for fun. But you have a degree! In English, guys, I'm a moron and things are not how they used to be. I have a friend I've known for almost my whole life who went to work as a mechanic at a pretty nice company where I am. He quit after two and a half years because he hated it. The chemicals, fumes, and conditions were affecting his overall health. I remember his parents giving him crap over it because it was a nice job with decent benefits and he made more money than most people in the rural area. He ended up taking a job working for the state where he cuts trees down along the roadways out of state highways and roads, making less than a third of his prior income, which sees him outside almost all hours of the day. He loves it, even during winter when it's cold as balls and the only heat comes from the interior of the vehicle they drive around. But he gets sunlight, fresh air, and he gets to work at a relatively even pace and barely gets any grief from management slash supervisors. My mom said something similar, like I'd be throwing my money away by renting an apartment or a house for the rest of my life. Like I'm already doing that with how unnecessarily expensive everything is. Now I'm expected to buy a $30,000 house for $500,000. Yeah, if you don't want to live in a small town, you're going to pay an arm and a leg for a house. What's worse, with rising housing costs, rental prices go up too, making it all the harder for people renting places to save up for a down payment on a house. I remember looking for an apartment when I had a job that paid around $45,000 a year. Not amazing, but not awful. I could barely afford a studio in the area. Story 2. My dad just died about a month ago. My company gave me four days unpaid off. I was really close to my father, so this was hard for me to deal with. My paycheck was enough to pay bills, but I had to buy my groceries on credit card to get by. My boss's brother-in-law died the following week. All he talks about is how hard this is on his wife. Between the stress of her brother dying and the Reno on their million-dollar cabin, he's taking his whole family to Hawaii for ten days this month to try and deal with their grief. Meanwhile, I'm pricing urns out on Amazon to try to save money, trying to sell my dad's tools to help my mom, working full-time, and taking care of a toddler. It didn't happen to me personally, but I've got an extremely similar story. I used to work with an extremely competent and really nice supervisor, we'll call her Sally, who didn't show up for work one day. Our boss Matt, who was also the owner, wanted to terminate Sally immediately until it came out that her husband died in a really violent freak accident. Cooler heads prevail. Matt backs off as I tell him that I can cover for Sally for as long as she needs. About two weeks pass, and in spite of Sally checking in every so often and being in the bereavement guidelines, Matt starts interrogating people, asking when Sally's returning, complaining that her coming in to collect a paycheck, side story Matt didn't believe in direct deposit, was really unprofessional given how long she'd been gone. 
He even starts quietly asking people how it would look if he went ahead and replaced Sally. Long story short, Sally ended up returning, like, immediately after the funeral was concluded. In my opinion, Matt indirectly pressured her to return. Three months later, Matt's dog died. Don't get me wrong, he was a gentle, adorable English bulldog that Matt would bring every so often, but he was also old and extremely sick, and Matt had about six months warning that his dog would pass away. Matt was utterly devastated, like ashes and sackcloth forlorn. Not only does he completely fall off the radar for a month, but he only resurfaced to have a meeting where he explains that he was headed to Hawaii to recenter, and I crap you not, looks Sally dead in the eyes and tells her that she should understand. I'm so sorry for your loss. Hang in there. Also, your boss is a D. Thank you. I just thought it was crazy that the staff I work with here went together, got me a sympathy card and a $175 gas card so I would have money to go see my mom. My boss didn't even get me a card. I've been here for 14 years. My dad is a customer here. He bought his truck and did his service work here. I hate companies like that because they expect you to make your job a super important part of your life while simultaneously not caring about your life. But the places that actually treat you like they care and give people a ton of leeway, I've worked to those places and they have some of the hardest working employees I've seen. Story 3. Anytime someone says, why did they throw that away? It could have been donated to a homeless person, when referring to extremely expired or broken items. While cleaning out my parents' house before they moved, I emptied their fridge and pantry and separated out the expired stuff. My dad went through and gathered most of the food into a donation box, and then scooped in all the expired food as well. Some of this stuff was years expired and even opened. My partner and I kept trying to remove it, and eventually it came down to an argument where my dad insisted that the homeless would take whatever they could get. My dad had never had the experience of going hungry while my partner had volunteered at food banks in the past. He was peed that my dad was treating homeless people as less than human and insisting they should be grateful to eat his garbage. Once my parents had left, I donated the expired food to the garbage can. If my dad was so concerned about wasting it, he should have either used it or donated it years ago when it was still safe to eat. I briefly went hungry for a few months after escaping domestic violence, I have a job and eat well now, and I definitely threw out expired food. Can't risk getting sick while poor with the way the U.S. healthcare system is. When I used to help a charity, we'd get people donating literal rags, torn t-shirts, and ruined trousers for the homeless saying, it's good for somebody. No, no it's not. These are worse than the clothes they are currently wearing. Why do some people think homeless people want junk? Don't they deserve something nice? I was sorting cans at the food pantry when someone donated about half a case of cheese bait in jars. If you're unfamiliar, it's a stinky cheese-like substance used primarily, IME, to catch catfish. This particular bait was obviously a decade or more old. The person working donations refused it because it isn't food. But you could sell it, that stuff's expensive, protested the donor. Yeah, we'll just run that down to our vintage bait stand and wait for the cash to roll in. It isn't like running this food pantry takes any time or effort. And folks, honestly, if you want to help out a food shelf, donate some cash. They can use that to buy what they need instead of getting the 500th can of creamed corn you didn't want to eat because that crap sucks. But hey, donate what you can, and if you have non-perishables, every bit helps. Story 4. Why are you still living at home at 23? Just buy a house. Coming from someone whose parents bought her a house. Have a friend whose wealthy parents paid for his schooling, his rent, his startup, his car, and his down payment. He asked when we were finally going to buy a house because renting is such a waste of money. My brother had half of his house paid for by his father-in-law. He kept telling that the house I'm looking at were too small and that I needed bigger to grow into, and I finally had to snap at him that I'm a single income and nobody is giving me a 50% down payment. Some people are just oblivious. My son is 26. He lives at home. He'd have to work approximately 3.5 full-time jobs to afford a house in this absurd market. Hell, I couldn't afford the house I live in now in this market. My house is currently valued at over twice what my mortgage is for, but if I sold it, I couldn't afford to. I'm 30 and living back at home for a year, finally going to be moving out with four friends so we can afford renting a house. One of us is an engineer and I work in IT and we can't really afford places on our own. Story 5. I don't know why you would go to a community college when you can go to a university, said by a high school guidance counselor giving a lecture on college admissions essays and applications in my senior AP English class after I asked naively if there's anything I had to do for community college. 
Turns out I had other classmates in the same boat who wanted to know too, but felt too embarrassed to ask. Anyway, I went to community college to get my prerequisites out of the way and got my associate's degree, then transferred into university for a competitive nursing program. I saved money from those first two years in community college, didn't get a loan until I got into uni. F that guidance counselor. Such bad advice. I went to a school in a wealthy area and the guidance counselor would tell us to go to community college, get straight A's, and an automatic acceptance into the local Ivy League school. If you can get the grades, it really is the best call financially. That's my plan currently, partly for the above it's cheaper for when I want to go to a four-year, but also because I'm not 100% sure that I'm going to go down the education route. And I don't want to get into an expensive college just to drop out with debt. As someone that went to an expensive college for education and dropped out and is still dealing with that debt, can I just say, good choice. Folks, don't feel pressured into college. Pursue it if what you want to do in life requires college. If you aren't sure what you want to do, two years of community college is a great option to learn about stuff, get an associate's degree to help with job opportunities, and all that jazz. Story 6. To preface for all the people trying to give me mortgage advice from the U.S., I live in Canada and our mortgage rules are extremely different. Thank you for the suggestions, but you cannot expect your home buying methods to work in a different country. Me conversing with a patient about the housing market when I was like 22. Me. Houses are so expensive it's going to be difficult to get into the market in a few years. This was some years ago. Patient whose husband inherited a lot of money and a business and now they're wealthy is F. Rent is the same as mortgage, though. Me. It's the down payment we need. Patient, why don't you just get your parents to give you the down payment? That's what ours did, and we paid them back. Me. My dad is dead, and my mom has a rare illness that placed her on long-term disability. Patient. Well, me. Not everybody has the same opportunities in life. Patient. Hmm. Story 7. A year ago, we were putting offers on houses, and our budget was low compared to what was available, and the realtor would ask, well, can't your parents help pitch in? LOL, what makes me think a lot of people are lucky enough for their parents to help with the home buying process, but yeah, not us. Going through that now, everyone in that industry thinks we could get a gift. B, even if they died, I wouldn't get anything for my parents. Sorry, it's frustrating. Ugh, this crap right here. I took my car in to get an oil change, and at the end, usually, they give you a list of improvements. The guy, 40, 50, his clerk, explained things to me, 25 female at the time, very condescendingly like I didn't know what brakes were. And at the end said, maybe this is something your mommy and daddy can help with. I just death glared at him and said, I don't have parents, and walked out. Story 8. I attend a typical rich kid's high school as one of the non-rich kids, at least at the standards of the environment I was in, my family was solidly middle class. The amount of asinine, delusional crap I heard on the daily made my skin crawl sometimes. When my ex-friend turned 16, her parents gave her one of their beamers. The thing was maybe five years old. She nonstop complained at the fact her parents had the audacity to give her a used car instead of buying her the new Audi she wanted. One day, she was on another diatribe about how much her parents sucked for giving her a hand-me-down car, and I snapped and told her that she should be grateful her parents had the mean to give her her own car in the first place, let alone a luxury vehicle. Her response? Well, it isn't my problem your parents don't work hard enough. I was a peasant who shared one of my parents' cars and took the bus. Sarcasm. Honestly, I feel at least a little bad for rich kids. They're raised with such a skewed idea of value, and it really will make it hard to connect with others. There's a good chance they'll get to coast through life, so I don't feel that bad, but I can't blame them either. They were born into that crap. Story 9. He told me as long as you're dating someone better looking than you, you're going to have to get used to me being hit on or having something on the side. You're going to have to date an ugly guy for that loyalty crap. Of all the insanity of this quote, the thing that gets me is the casual equating of something that cannot be controlled, me being hit on, with the opposite, me having someone on the side. It's like, look, as long as we live in an area with a lot of flowers, sometimes I'm going to get allergies or murder people. I mean, someone has to push up the daisies. Love it when toxic people tell you that you have to get used to or deal with their toxicity. Not deal with, but have the privilege of the toxicity. Narcissists don't see it as toxic. You are graced with their presence and lucky to have them in your life.
Story 10. I grew up super poor, like going days without eating kind of poor, all because my mom legit thought welfare was only for unwed black mothers. She never called anybody to confirm that, never asked around. She wouldn't apply for reduced school lunches either because that was ghetto. Imagine being so racist and buying into the welfare queen lie so hard that you let your own children starve. I am so, so sorry. My family was very poor and we weren't on welfare for long stretches of time because my mom would mess up the paperwork, but the difference between when we were not and when we were was vast. The struggle to have lunch food or scrape up change to buy lunch versus giving a code and sitting down with a meal? Vast. You and your siblings deserved assistance. Story 11. Africa is a country. In front of an Ethiopian who insisted that Africa is a continent. This and those puzzled people who meet African immigrants and wonder if they are hungry, thirsty, or are surprised slash impressed that they know what civilization is. It's interesting how many people think that all of sub-Saharan Africa is just collections of thatched hut filled with fly-covered, pot-bellied children and half-naked, floppy-breasted women. Maybe some guys with spears and bones in their noses standing off to the side. Show such people the skyline of Lagos or Nairobi and they'll be trying to figure out which state or European country they're looking at. Story 12. Why don't you live on disability? As a response to disabled people complaining about local government cutting back programs designed for making gainful employment accessible. I work with disabled adults. This is a bigger problem than most people realize. And people don't realize that many government programs demand that you stay permanently in abject poverty. Get a part-time job? F you. No more health care. No more food. No more housing assistance. No more disability income. Accidentally save more than $2,000? F you too. And without that little bit of help? Homeless and starving and totally effed and disabled. I've known a few folks on disability, and the system for it is just as bad as these folks are saying. If you're on disability, which pays hardly enough to get by, and try to make more, they cut off your disability. So if you get any kind of job, it better pay noticeably more than your disability payment. But you are on disability for a reason, so this magical job better also cater to that disability. It's absurd. Story 13. The company owes you nothing. You owe the company everything. My boss after I worked for four years in the company. I used to work for a guy who owned a temporary employment agency. I once watched him berate his two $7 an hour receptionist because his monthly income from the business had dropped from $40,000 to $25,000. And they had nothing whatsoever to do with how much money the business made. They were effing receptionists. Temp agencies are the worst. They benefit the companies they work with and themselves. The employees get effed by both. I would laugh in my boss's face if she said that to me. I don't mean that in an I'm so edgy way, I just wouldn't be able to contain it. Story 14. Sort of tangential. Back in college, the entire class had a 10 minute argument with one student who didn't understand that not every country had citizenship by birth laws like the US does. The professor held off jumping in for about five minutes to watch us explain it to her, but couldn't take it anymore and figured the student would finally believe it when she said it. Nope, she started arguing with the professor too. The totally out of touch part came when she finally conceded with, well that's stupid, they should just do things the way we do them here. Wow, I wasn't aware of that. I also wouldn't argue with people telling me that though either. Very, very, very few countries equate birth with citizenship. Please like and subscribe if you've made it this far. I hope you'll enjoy the rest of the video and have a wonderful day. Story 15. I used to work for a minor aristocrat. Some advice he gave out in absolute sincerity over the years. Don't take out a mortgage, whatever you do. Terrible things. You'll end up paying a lot more for your house, you know. The thing about a Bentley is that you have to have a crap car, too. I mean, there are times when a Bentley just isn't appropriate and what you need is a crap car. Crap car later turned out to be an expensive Alfa Romeo and a Bentley to be several Bentleys. Recommending the Ritz in London as a place for regular after-work drinks. I don't know how anyone survives on their company salary alone. His salary was more than 300,000 pounds, US dollars 500,000, a year. I am absolutely shocked that so much of this out-of-touch advice is coming from rich people. I mean, who would have thought? They're clearly smart enough to get rich. Why wouldn't they have good advice? Story 16. My boss told me that the leasing of our company car is ending and I could buy it for really cheap if I want it. 
really cheap, meant 20,000 euros for him. He pays me 750 euros a month. I'm still in training, that's why it's so little. And I live on my own and have a car, so basically I'd have to work about two years for this really cheap car without spending a cent on anything. Man, this just pees me off so much. Like, I get that rich people simply have no idea what it's like to live on a limited income. But your boss literally pays you your wage. He knows exactly how much you make. So what? He can't do basic effing addition to realize this isn't cheap? F me, man. Some people. Of course I'm aware of how little you make. I just assumed you were supplementing your income with your trust fund like any ordinary person. Story 17. I was working at a school for the kids of the 1% and we were discussing what a millionaire was. One example I gave was owning property or assets worth a million or over, and the kid replied, Oh, so everyone is a millionaire then? Everyone, all of the classmates, maybe not the teacher. A relative of mine was a teacher at a high-end private school. When asked by her preschool kids what she'd do on her summer vacation, she said she'd catch up on some books, go see some movies, go to the park, etc. One of them asked, You don't go to your summer home? Story 18. When a guy on Am I the A-Hole was upset his wife was making him babysit their infant too much, so he and his mom told her there'd be no more going out. He said him going out all the time was different than her going out, and when asked for clarification, he said, because she's better at changing diapers and getting the baby to sleep. It truly blows my mind that there are morons out there who think taking care of their own child is babysitting. I had a guy at work complain to me that he couldn't go play golf that weekend because he had to babysit his kids. I said, you know, most people just call that being a father, right? Story 19. Gal Gadot and friends singing Imagine during the first few days of lockdown is up there. Imagine no possessions, said in their multi-million dollar mansions. Elton John made fun of John and Yoko for the song. John and Yoko were as bad as me when it came to shopping. The various apartments they owned in the Dakota in New York City were so full of priceless artworks, antiques, and clothes that once I sent them a card rewriting the lyrics to Imagine, Imagine six apartments. It isn't hard to do. One is full of fur coats. Another's full of shoes. I used to be an all-state choir back in high school. Now listen to me. Good lord. Story 20. If you're depressed, just go to Tullum and take a break. Vibe high. Like B, that is not how depression works. And yeah, I'll just leave all my responsibilities just for randomly deciding going to vacations. When I told her that's not the way how depression works, she said, You are just too pessimistic. Every time I feel depressed, I do this. I asked how she knew she was depressed, and she answered, Well, the last time I had depression was because I cried because my dad didn't want to take me to Paris for a year. I wanted to die in that moment. Story 21. External things don't affect your mental health. It's all about you. Seeing my girlfriend killed didn't affect me because it was an external thing. My PTSD is all me. I relate. However, it was my mother, not my girlfriend. I hope you found supportive people to surround yourself with. Otherwise, you'll never be able to heal. It took me my entire childhood until I moved out and finally started to see a difference. Much love for you. Story 22. We're human beings and the sun is the sun. How can it be bad for you? I don't think anything that's natural can be bad for you. Gwyneth Paltrow, 2013. Let's say I get bitten by a rattlesnake. I shouldn't be worried. The venom's natural, isn't it? Just a note, she was saying this because she thought that the sun couldn't possibly be bad for you. Fifteen minutes of sun a day should be healthy for anyone. Pure radioactive sunlight. No SPF. I really kind of want a whole thread that is just bad advice from Gwyneth Paltrow. Then again, I'm not sure I have enough time to record a video that long. Story 23. That allowing ice fishing shacks would then give rise to prostitution. I live in a place where ice fishing is impossible and prostitution is legal. I don't understand how these two things could be linked. The mayor of Hudson, Ohio suggested that allowing people to build ice fishing shacks on Lake Erie would lead to prostitution. We don't understand how he got from ice fishing to prostitution either. Story 24. Had a friend in dental school who grew up in the rich suburbs north of Detroit. We were talking about traveling. She was going to Thailand for spring break, and she said, I'd be surprised if most people hadn't traveled to at least 20 countries. 
I told her I'd be surprised if most people had ever left the U.S. at all. Ah, to be rich enough to travel to at least 20 countries. I haven't even visited 20 states. Story 25. Had a millionaire tell me it was so great that even though we could all be making much more than we were at our nonprofit, we stayed for the kids because who needs money when your job is rewarding? Plot twist, he was a board member who controlled our salaries. I was barely making enough to scrape by. That sentiment is everywhere in nonprofits, sadly. Story 36. Suggested someone take the bus to save on gas prices. They responded, Ew, do you know what kind of people take the bus? Yeah, working class people. And also me. I wish there was more money put into making better public transportation all around. I love taking the bus when I can, but in my suburb, it would add about an hour or so to most of the trips I take. Not quite worth it. Please leave your story in the comments. I would love to make a video on them in the future. Also, don't forget to like and subscribe.